Okay, hello everyone, and hi everyone on Zoom. Um, my lecture is entitled Multitasking Like a Boss. And um, honestly, I'm not sure how I stumbled upon this topic. I'm definitely not the most efficient multitasker you know, um, although I do um, juggle a lot of tasks as all of you do, um, and I, I enjoy juggling. Um, it's also something that I recognize as a key function to our work as emergency medicine physicians. And this topic really gave me the opportunity to reflect on how far I've come across residency and also think about ways I can continue to improve um, multitasking as I move into um, the next step of my career as an attending. Multitasking is a performance of multitasks at once. We all know this. I'm gonna go over the expectations um, of us as emergency physicians pitfalls of multitasking and strategies to cope in a multitasking environment. So just to uh, give a quick definition of what I mean by multitasking. Um, so two tasks perform simultaneously, um, but really we know that most tasks aren't performed simultaneously. Um, although we can perform automatic tasks simultaneously. Like you can, usually it's two motor tasks or a motor task and a cognitive task, and those are tasks that are um, have become automatic for us, that have just been nailed into um, our brains through repetition. Um, however, usually when we're multitasking, we're really task switching. And that's because our brain just can't process multiple tasks at once. So we're constantly moving back and forth between the tasks. And this, uh, this picture of the funnel is just to get this concept of, you know, we have all these tasks we're juggling, um, but really we can only give full attention to one task at a time. All right, so multitasking is one of our subcompetencies that's measured in new innovations. And um, basically level one, you know, we, we all know we're, we're starting with just a one patient to a few patients, managing the tasks related to those patients. And by level four, we should be able to employ task switching in an efficient, timely manner in order to manage the entire emergency department, or at least for us, maybe on a busy sub uh, sweet day, day, part of that emergency department. Um, ABEM also recognizes multitasking as a chief competency, and they test that during the oral boards by giving us these multiple case scenarios where we're presented with three cases at once. And this is a picture of the Marriott and O'Hare. Uh, for some reason, this is where, at least pre-COVID, this is where oral boards what, took place. Um, and this is where our ability to multitask was tested. Although we know that the emergency department is more like this. Um, where there are in unpredictable volumes, patient pre presentations with a lot of ambiguity. Um, there's in constant interruptions. There's a time pressure. There's a lot of different noises and smells, a lot of different personalities. This is really the environment where we thrive. Multitasking um, has a lot of... Um, there's a lot of flaws with multitasking, you know, like outside just to be productive in life and get through, you know, working on a presentation or a project, you want to try to avoid multitasking. But in the emergency department, um, which I'm going to get to, uh, the, the ideal is really to go through tasks in, uh, into session, one after another. But in the emergency department, this is not possible, where, uh, where there are cr critical interruptions. Um, and, you know, we need to move between patients. And, you know, if we just took one patient at a time, completed that waited for another patient, there would be a lot of time spent doing nothing. So I'm gonna go over these pitfalls of multitasking. Before I do that though, I just wanna quickly go over cognitive load theory, which describes our memory uh, or splits our memory up into long-term memory, which in theory is, is limitless and short-term memory, uh, which is our working memory. And every time we're faced with a task, um, we are we are occupying space in our in our in our working memory, and our working memory ha is, has a limited capacity, and um, the amount of space each task takes up depends on these three factors. So the intrinsic load is just the the difficulty of a task, right? So a, a you know a task with a low intrinsic note load is coming up with a, the dose for Tylenol for an adult patient with a headache. Um, but it might be a, a higher intrinsic load if this is a pediatric patient and not only do you have to do weight-based dosing, but you have to think about what can be easily um, obtained from the Pyxis and drawn up into a syringe. Extrinsic load is the filtering, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sorry, I just choked on my own spit. <coughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> um, in, intrinsic extrinsic load is the filtering of information as you receive it, and um, you know the high extrinsic load for us something you know we, we think about as a, a the poor historian um, when somebody is giving us a lot of information that might not be relevant to their to the medical condition they're presenting with. We have to filter through that information. And then germane load is just the process of linking information together as you're receiving it. So that's, you know, if a patient comes in with dizziness, as we're receiving this information, we're linking it together to come up with a differential for, for dizziness. All right, so maxing it out on our cognitive load and taking on multiple tasks um, does have a, a, an effect on our efficiency. So it's known that we, that we become less efficient when when we keep switching between tasks. And that's why ideally we should be doing tasks um, in succession. Uh, there's definitely a time cost involved in shifting mental gears. Um, and that's because there's a psychological refractory period in, in that the first task needs to be fully completed before starting a new task. And this can lead, uh, taking on a high co uh, cognitive load can also cause redundancy. You know, the feeling of just you're, you're checking the labs over and over again for the same patient, even though you already did that because you have six patients you're working with. Um, and especially, you know, if you're not staying organized by writing things down or checking off boxes, you might be doing the same work over and over again. And then not returning to tasks. So when, you're cogn when your cognitive overload is strained, um, you might forget to put on, a, um, or if you get interrupted, you might forget to put in orders for a patient. If you notice this two, two hours into their course, obviously that's going to decrease your efficiency. So I wanna do a, just a quick task switching exercise to, to demonstrate um, what, what, I, what I was just talking about. So Willis has just before my lecture agreed to be my volunteer and David is gonna count for this. So you, do you have a timer? Okay, so what, on, on David's go, um, you're gonna recite the alphabet. Ready? Yeah, count. Three, two, one. Great, how many seconds? Five seconds, all right. All right, now count to 26. On David's go. All right, wow, so fast. And now, <laughs> yeah. and now combine those. So A1, B2, C3. <laughs> so, so yeah I, I did this with a couple of people and it was so uh what was it 12 seconds um and combined for the alphabet and then 26 and it's like around 40 seconds 50 seconds and you were worried about making an error yeah. right which is going to lead me into the next part of this which is reduced quality um, so psychologists have found over and over again that when people focus on more than one task, performance suffers. One of the areas this is most uh, widely discussed in is driving. So we all know when you text and drive, there's a higher rate of accidents. And that's, I mean, that's because you're, um, not only is your focus um, split, but you're also looking away from the road. But it's also been proven that um, talking on, this, on the phone also increases the rate of accidents. And that's even if it's hand, hands-free. In medicine, um, the area where this is research um, in most detail is in medication errors. So a journal, a systematic review published in 2015 in the Journal of Clinical Nursing found that over half of medication errors were due to, to interruptions. And I'm sure we, we can all think of a moment where, you know, maybe we're about to put in orders for a patient, we get interrupted, and then that case we realize we're putting, we start putting orders on the wrong patient. All right, um, Daniel Cannonham uh, is the author of a, is a psychologist and author of a really great book called Thinking Fast and Slow, where he describes two types of thinking: System One thinking and System Two thinking. And System One thinking um, is responsible for all you know our automatic behaviors. This is where also our biases lie, just our emotional actions. Um, and then System Two thinking is really when we we think through a um, through a task. 
And um, when there's cognitive over, when you have cognitive overload, you're taking on a high task burden, dif difficult tasks, you're more likely to resort to system one thinking. Um, so I, I'm not going to go too in, in depth into this, and um, although I, like I'm really interested in cognitive biases, implicit bias, um, but Eden had a really great lecture on cognitive bias. Um, so the one example I will give is that um, in this book, um, he talks about um, the study where they found that um, as patients were given a difficult task, increasing their cognitive load um, and offered chocolate cake versus fruit salad. Um, they were more likely to choose chocolate cake after the more difficult task. Um, and that's just, you know, are, because you're over reliance on system one thinking, system one turns out like junk food. And I think most of us can relate to this um, from experiences on shift going to the deli. All right, anxiety and stress. There are physiological effects of increasing cognitive um, load. So the more we use our system to thinking, um, our heart rate increases, our muscles tense up, our pupils dilate. They've actually shown like shown this how you know based on the the level of a task, um, the pupils become more dilated. And um, when we think about like you know, just being in the emergency department, especially early on in our training, um, when we're you know we're just developing our medical knowledge and we have little limited clinical experience, every task is difficult. Um, so we easily overload our, our, we can easily reach cognitive overload. Um, add that uh, to just like, you know, our just work hours and, and a lot of other stressors that we face in the emergency department. Um, and, you know, no wonder we feel like this after work, physically and mentally exhausted. Many times throughout residency, um, even now, and mo uh, definitely when I was an intern, second year, um, starting third year, I often looked uh, like up to the seniors and the tenings and just like, I just, it, it seems superhuman. How do they juggle all these tasks? Um, and there is, there is this concept um, that a psychologist named David Stryer coined as a super tasker, um, where he, his research has found that um, you, that for 2% of the population, their performance actually improves with multitasking rather than um, uh, getting worse. And you can actually test your, your multitasking ability on this like this website that he created uh, called supertasker.org. Um, but I don't know who, I don't know if Kelly is an actual, you know, natural multitasker and or which of our attendings are. Um, but I know that there that everyone has become an effective task switcher and we all will be too. Um, and I'm just going to go over some strategies to help um, with becoming effective task switchers. All right, so the most important thing um, is sick versus not sick, right? We learn this right away. That's like the, you know, we need to, we need to be cognizant about prioritizing our tasks to effectively task switch. And the most important thing for us is, is what is actually critical. And I talked to a lot of attendings about their methods of, of prior, prioritizing tasks. And um, for, for, for most of them, uh, the, the uh, first thing was to see all patients because that's how they're able to determine what is critical and what's not critical. Um, just to, there, there's, there are, there are a lot of different types of tasks. I just wanted to like point out a few things. So sick versus not sick. Uh, a lot of times dispositions came and I'm going to discuss that a little bit. Um, I thought it was also interesting. A lot of attendants didn't really have a, a set uh, method that they used every time for task prioritization and it came subconsciously. So I asked Brewster about this yesterday on shift actually. And she says that she uses a um, task prioritizing tool in her life in general. She's a physician, administrator, MBA student, mom, and it uses an ABC form of triage. And she just kind of subconsciously does that as at work as well. Um, Ahern creates this mental map in his mind um, and creates, sees all the patients, comes up with a plan and then uh, groups tasks based on short-term and long-term goals, doing critical tasks first for each patient. So I thought it was really interesting just to see different methods, but you will develop your own method or you should, should really be intentional about developing your own method because when you have a high task burden, it's important to prioritize those tasks. Um, just a quick thing on dispositions and delegation. I remember this dispositions, uh, so for some people it comes naturally, you wanna get 
patients out the door or admitted. For me, I, I originally thought, all right, so I know what the plan for this patient. They can kind of like hang out there while I do these other things that are important. Um, but what is really important about dispositions as well as delegation is cognitive offloading. Um, and that will really help you get through, through more tasks and be able to take on a higher task load. Interruptions. This is my dog, Luna. Um, and I want you to, to um, <laughs> interrupt me all the time. And I, I want you to just give a few just common interruptions in the emergency department. If anyone, I actually don't have the, the chat up here. So sign the CKG. Sign the CKG. Um, sorry, David, is it, how do we put up the chat? I'm not seeing the, um, sign the CKG, sorry. What, what else? Chemistry lab. Radiology is on the phone there. Yeah, it's, it's limitless, right? Um, I just like one specific thing, Priyanka during my last uh, my last shift with her was like, oh, who's that? Like in the middle of doing something and it was like, oh, that's an ele electrician. <laughs> just like a ra random interruptions come um, come from everywhere. Um, I created a, sh uh oh, no, I can't switch. Uh, there's so many good ones on that too. Okay. Oh, yeah. No. All right. So this is the short list I came up with, um, which many, I am diabetic. I need food. I'm reading off the comments now because there's, so, there's a lot of good ones. Um, all right. Um, resident is hungry, change orders, all these things. It's, it's endless. Um, so the, the important, one thing with interruptions though, is that we need to decide if those are, that's an interruption that's going to break our task, right? So you can, an interruption, you know, you hear code 66, D building. Third floor, you can quickly return to your task without much delay there. Um, or if you, if somebody comes to your desk as you're writing a note, you can take a moment and just say, um, you know, I, I need to finish this note and finish your task. Um, but other other interruptions, you're not going to be able to do that. And if a patient runs to you asking for a urinal and it's a it's in a state of emergency, you're going to get up, stop what you're doing, and grab them a urinal. Um, same with a, a the nurse telling you um, there's a Sinner says, get pizza. <laughs> get, a, get a slice of pizza. Um, just reading that, that's funny. Um, um, yeah, so, um, you know, nurse tells you that somebody is becoming hypotensive. You're, that's going to cause a break in task, and you're going to start a new task. All right. Um, this is from an observational study conducted at three EDs. Um, where a single observer shadowed ER attendings and counted the number of tasks, interruptions, and breaks in tasks. Um, just highlighting the urban site. So over a 180 period, 80 minute study period, 10 patients, um, 59 tasks with those patients, 26 interruptions, and 17 of those interruptions led to a break in tasks. And this is just to demonstrate, you know, um, just the, the, the number of tasks and interruptions we, we face on a daily basis. Think about a 12 hour shift. And obviously the more patients you take on, the more tasks, more interruptions you take on. All right, so just quickly, if anyone can come up with some some actions we can take as individuals to limit interruptions on shift for the, the those interruptions that are avoidable. Any any thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, all right. Avoiding eye contact. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And that took me a long time. Yeah, no, it takes a long time, and I think it's really with only the fact that I. Right, right, right. And someone comes and talks to you and you're writing a note. I mean, you could, I guess, continue, which I do sometimes, just continue to the, write the note as they're talking to you. But I mean, you're not giving them attention anyway. So you might as well just say, hold on. Um, so uh, these are just, so communication is a great one. Um, mindfulness is one that I thought of just because, um, and you know, this is also from my reading, just because it, not only is there external stimuli, there's also internal stimuli. So um, just the practice of mindfulness, so that you know we're not bringing what uh, what we just went through at home. If there was like you know some just thinking, does Luna have food um, <laughs> like available for her, or or something that might you know going into work after an argument or even experiencing an argument at work or um, a difficult case. How do we move forward and stay focused in our tasks after experiencing that? It's, it's definitely an art and it takes time to develop. Um, 
and then limiting of obviously tech distractions, which is hard every time like I get us got a citizen notification, it was really difficult not to look. Um, and delegating tasks. Oh, I, I meant to ask for administrative actions, but um, just some administrative actions. Is there any any other administrative action, actions? Like I thought of definitely limiting ER visit times. EMR can help or hurt um, in terms of interruptions, and then definitely offloading non-clinical tasks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it just like just facilitating the general flow, our, our general workflow. Um, and, and for offloading tasks, I think it's an important one because, you know, when we think about these transport forms and even just, um, you know, uh, getting a uh, patient water and sandwich and I, all of us are doing that all the time. We're running around looking for the fridge that has the, the sandwich available. Um, and, and we do, we, we care, that's why we do that. But it does really take our focus away from the tasks we need to complete and, and causes us to, to do more task switching. So it's something we should be aware of and the reason why it's so important to have um, to be able to offload this this clinical non-clinical work because it's important that it gets done but maybe not by us um, so we, we can't block out all interruptions the no eye contact uh, <laughs> comment was great because actually second year I, I, I actually had a moment where I, or a, few, a bunch of shifts that I would wear um, earplugs. Um, because I just like I couldn't focus. There was just too much, and I just wanted to be able to see my patients and write the notes, and and that's it. <laughs> um, but you can't do that, <laughs> and especially like as a third year, you come in and you have so many more responsibilities. You know, calming the fire before it starts, um, and you know, in the hallway when maybe um, there before like a fight breaks out between patients or noticing the, you know, that somebody is screaming in pain. Um, we have to be aware of everything that's going on and there's interruptions that are gonna be critical. Um, so we need to just be able to, to manage them. Um, and then team functioning. I thought this was interesting. I was talking to Kelly and Little um, about, about inter managing interruptions. And I asked them about just like, you know, how do you manage just all the interruptions from residents? Like they're holding the, all these, the, the plans and um, for all these patients in their head. And anytime I ask them a question, they're gonna, they never say, hold on. <laughs> um, really like they will, uh, um, they will take a presentation at any point, you know, like uh, just as they say, stand up from their desk to do a task. Um, and the reason is because um, they realize that um, it, it's a rate limiting step for us. So we are a team. Um, and if I'm unable to present my case um, or, you know, ask that question that I need, you know, where's the whatever supply I need for a procedure, I'm not going to be able to move forward and do do my task. And this is part of why we're so interruption driven. Um, uh, it's how it's how we function. All right, this is a review on multitasking um, that just I just quickly to go over it. Um, it just demonstrates how we start off a task. So what is the task that they give? Uh, all right, listen, we're listening to a patient history. The nurse pulls us aside to um, ask us a question. We're just coming up with an answer for that question um, and we're about to help and then we get pulled aside because there's a critical patient. And every time we get pulled away from, uh, from the task, we're getting pulled further and further away from the original tasks. Um, so first thing is it's important to, to complete your tasks in a timely manner. So you know, the goal of just completing your notes right away, um, taking, uh, getting quicker with just the assessment of patients um, so that you complete your task before you're interrupted. Um, but another big thing is controlling timing of interruptions. Um, and then and then just talking through, you know, a lot of us do this, a lot of attendings do this is tasking groups together because um, grouping, I mean, grouping tasks together because uh, that will really decrease your cognitive uh, load. And cues to return to task. So this is just running the list, right? How do we remember to get back to that original task when we've been pulled now, you know, four tasks from there. Um, and this is, you know, just some people, uh, Jane Kim, Wiener, you see them with a, like a lot of, not, not a lot, it's condensed, but they're always taking notes. Um, other people just use the Epic board. Um, some people just keep it all in their head, whatever the method is, just continuously running the list. Um, and then communication is another big one for uh, a cue to return to task. Because if you're telling the patient the plan, the nurse the plan, you're communicating the plan constantly, then um, you're going to be less likely to forget. 
So anxiety and stress. Um, can you relate to like be arriving to the pod at three at, for a three p.m. shift and you have take on um, you know seven patients, seven patients. That's a say that's a task load of forty. Um, you're now th then three hours later into your shift and you haven't displayed a patient. Does, does that happen to anyone or like we're just there's difficult dispo sometimes um, and difficult tasks and it leads to a lot of cognitive strain and it causes a lot of anxiety and stress and that's um, if that happens um, it's important to take a take a step back from um, from all of your tasks reprioritize come up with a plan of action and then identify areas um, where you're really bogged down so um, really asking for help so that you can get things done. And ideally, you'd be doing this before you get to that point of like cognitive, like a real stress. Does anybody play chess? Wow. You do? Sure. Oh, sure. We should play. <laughs> oh, no. <it's> <laughs> All right. Well, I love chess. Um, <laughs> um, chess club in, the, in middle school. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, just wanted to go over <laughs> chunking theory really quick. Um, so we can retain seven pieces of information um, in our like limited working memory space. And chunking is a way to bypass that. It's a, it's a method of like meaningfully grouping information together. Um, and that it's, it's creating patterns which are stored into your memory, your long-term memory. Um, this this uh, psychologist did group showed a chess position to a, a variety of players, um, gave them two to 15 seconds to determine their next move, and then took the board away. Asked them to recreate the board. And the novice players were able to uh, recreate about 50% of the board, or more novice players, they're not like beginner players. And then the grandmasters were able to create recreate 93% of the board. Um, and that's because they're that's the way they're, they're seeing uh, that's what, how they're deciding their next board. They're seeing, I mean, the next move, they're seeing the entire board. And I like to think of the emergency department as a chessboard, um, where we start off just seeing, you know, when we're thinking of our next move, we're just thinking about how a few pieces interact with each other. Um, and then, you know, we, we learn um, to, see, to see the entire board and, you know, run the room. And these are just some, uh, just going back to working memory and decreasing our cognitive load. So these are ways to decrease the intrinsic, extrinsic, and germane loads. Um, so difficult tasks. I mean, first of all, we have to recognize that there are difficult tasks um, and we need to work on self-directed studying on those tasks. Um, decreasing our extrinsic load, it's not really about the poor historian, but just learning to write, ask the right questions. Um, and then germane load, that process of linking information together, that's where these frameworks come in, going through simulations. Um, generally, everything amounts to experience, um, but with, you know, everything we learn for, in residency is all through like observation, practice, and self-directed learning. This is my last um, point. Um, I wanted to reflect on what brought me happiness at work. And, um, this, this is a picture um, in Utah, a hike called the Narrows, which is like the most beautiful hike I've ever done. Um, and this definitely brings me happiness, but I wanted to think about what brought me happiness at work. Um, and I, I call my mom pretty much after every shift and she asks me how I'm doing. And honestly, usually the feeling is, is annoyed. <laughs> and, then I, and then I like, you know, complain <laughs> and she listens. Um, and uh, even if I'm, you know, I start the day off in a chipper mood, halfway through, I'm in a good mood. By the end of the shift, I, I often feel annoyed. I don't know if anyone can, can relate to that. Um, and even, even like happy moments with patients and with colleagues and, you know, good diagnoses and um, those get washed away during a 12 hour shift. Um, but there are certain times when I actually feel really good after shift. After a 12 hour shift, I feel energized, I feel fulfilled. Um, and this brings me to this idea of flow, um, which um, Mahali Sisant Mahali, um, a psychologist who studies the um, happiness, um, describes as um, the state of effortless attention. Um, it's like, we, we also think of this, you know, in sports, like being in the zone, uh, runner's high. Um, and 
certain characteristics of this is like, so it's effortless attention. So you're less likely to be fatigued um, by, because there's no energy required for like that self-control of like, this is what I have to like, you know, this is what I have to do next. I have to keep working um, because it almost flows like effortlessly. Um, goals are clear and you have control over your tasks. You feel challenged, but confident you won't fail. Um, and in the emergency department, that ha has to do a lot with also just having the support there. Um, 12 hour shifts fly by and you feel rewarded afterwards. And I know, you know, not every shift is gonna be like this for me moving forward, um, but I hope that be, by, by being a little bit more intentional about my workflow, I can have more shifts where I can reach that state of flow. So takeaway points, um, task switching decreases deficiency. Um, and leads to errors. Um, we should recognize this, uh, be aware Be aware of this um, during shift um, because stakes are high in, in the decisions we make. Um, be intentional about task switching, um, work on decreasing your cognitive load for tasks, um, take, in, take control of interruptions um, and complete your tasks. Um, as quickly as possible. Um, take or that no, just end and work on completing your tasks by grouping tasks and returning to task when you get interrupted. And um, I hope everyone finds their flow. Take a deep breath. Ask for help. Any questions or comments? Okay. Then. Thank you. Yes, I think it's great, like, and I think it's a really important topic for us. Um, I think it's real important to remember that you cannot do two things at once. You have to test switch back and forth, and if you try, you're going to fail. Um, for you of the senior residents in the room who are going to be attending to, I think the most important thing you can do is see the patients before the residents, because you'll know what's wrong already. And you don't have to pay super close, like, on point, Pay attention to everything the residents say while they're presenting. So you can let your mind run the room and do other stuff while they're presenting. So that's a large chunk of your time between the patients. They take up a very large part of time. So if you already know the patient and you know what their plan is, then you can listen to their presentation and point out anything that you want. But for the most part, you're running the room in your head and you're getting your other pieces of information in a row. Mm -hmm. And then when you come up with a plan, you pay attention and you go over the plan with the residents. But seeing the patient first before them, is super important because you don't have to use so much energy, mental energy. Right. That's a large portion of your day, just listening to presentations. That you're just doing things twice. You saw the patient and you're listening. It's sort of a waste of your time. Mm -hmm. Good point. All right. Thanks, Yana. Yeah, we have a little time. Thank you. And uh, just, I love you all. So thank you. Thank you.